Pete Calandra here. This is the second video of a series on scoring short films. In the first video of the series, I talked a bit about the benefits of scoring short films and also a bit about how the music typically plays out and how it differs from scoring a feature film. The short take is that music in a short film oftentimes takes on the characteristics of a musical suite, where you have a series of short pieces played one after the other. I do work on thematic development when writing this music, as I'll show you in the following score, but things do tend to happen at a more rapid pace than in a feature film. Today's film is the Norman Lear biopic from the 2017 Kennedy Center Honors. The music is orchestral in nature and goes through a variety of moods and styles as the piece unfolds. As this was my work copy, the voiceover here was done by the video editor. If you like this video, give a thumbs up. For more content, please subscribe and to be notified, ring that bell. Please leave any comment or questions below. Thanks for watching and let's get started. I have never been in a situation in my life, however tragic where I didn't see some comedy, just growing up the way I grew up. Norman Milton Lear grew up in New Haven, Connecticut. His father, Herman, gave him the nickname Meathead. Let me tell you something, Mr. Bunker. No, let me tell you something, Mr. Stivic. You are a meathead. <laughs> what did you call me? A meathead, dead from the neck up. Meathead. <laughs> Herman favored colorful expressions, often encouraging Norman's mother, Jeanette, a.k.a. Dingbat, to stifle. Will you stifle? <laughs> Young Norman was an astute observer, never forgetting the experiences or words that shaped him. One day, while listening to his crystal radio, he heard Catholic priest Father Coughlin preach anti-Semitism. We believe in Christ, principle, and I challenge every Jew in this nation to tell me that he does not believe in it. Norman remembered that sermon for the rest of his life. And when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, he left the safety of college to enlist in the Army Air Corps. I wanted to be known as a Jew who served, he'd later say. After the war, Norman moved his young family to Los Angeles and tried his hand at writing for television variety shows. It wasn't long after that he made his mark with films, earning an Oscar nomination for Divorce, American Style. But all the while, the country was facing social turmoil and a revolution of ideas. Stunned by the banality of television, Norman put a spotlight on the issues of the day and made us confront our own humanity. He made television accountable and changed its role in our culture forever. To his great delight, Norman was placed on Nixon's enemies list. And yes, there's a tape. And on this regular show, it's on every week. So what's it called? Archers, guys, communists, the right wingers, trying to destroy us. When the moral majority proclaimed the United States a Christian nation, Norman became a full-time activist. He founded People for the American Way and wrote television specials that celebrated our liberty. You can call me old boy, but let's just keep it simple. Uh, just call me Flag. In 2000, Norman bought an original copy of the Declaration of Independence and toured it around the country so kids could see the nation's birth certificate. Norman, you were a patriot, a family man, a friend, and one of the most influential producers of our time. And for that, we the people are forever One of my creative concepts is that every project is unique and requires an approach dictated by the goal of the project. That is for the creative aspect. There are technical things I employ on almost every film score that helps to achieve that approach, and I do these things before I get started composing. As in the first episode of the series, 
I use markers based on spotting notes to set up the structure of the piece. These are done and locked to time code and not to any bar number. I also tend to make a template for each project rather than have a huge template that I use for everything I work on. This lets me create a palette that is unique to the job at hand. And I also organize all my tracks into groups and then route all the outputs of these groups to their own AUGS channel and then use VCAs as an overall level and solo control for individual groups. The added benefit of VCA tracks is that they make a separation between sections much like you would see on a traditional score paper. This is an orchestral score. There are solo instruments, solo sections, ensemble patches, and performance patches like Spitfire Evos and Swarms that can add quite a bit of life to the emotion of a sample-based realization. So let's take a quick look at this. Starting on the top right here, I have Albion 1 High Winds. These are all my high winds, piccolo, flute. These are Spitfire Symphonic, oboe, right here. Actually, let me make these bigger so that you can see them. And I'll just scroll up and down. Then English horn, clarinet. And notice, here's my VCA, and I've got this set for the high winds, and you'll see that there's a line here that separates the high winds from the low winds, and that helps me in organization. And then for the low winds, I'm just using some Albion patches here. So these are ensemble low winds from Albion 1. And then to get a little bit more fullness, Albion 3, which is really spectacular. Sounds like some sort of contra instrument added in there. And here in the brass, which is this pinkish, got mid brass from Albion One. Combination probably of trombones and French horns, solo trumpet, solo horn, and then solo horn tenuto. I only have this individual patch because it only plays in one spot. Two horns, and then 12 horns, and this is the only patch that's not from Spitfire. This is from Cine Samples. Then we've got two trombones, then Albion one low brass. Albion 3 low brass. Just, it's got more oomph to it. Then we have our brat low brass VCA, and we've got cymbals. Mostly use this for cymbal rolls. And then we've got timp. So this is the orchestral timpani. Snares, tubular bells, orchestra bells, ivory piano, Spitfire harp. String runs. I believe these are also Cine Sample, now that I think about it. And I only have this at the very end of the piece. And then this is the Spitfire orchestral violin, and it's spiccato. And I've got the same thing for the second violins. Spitfire viola, cello, and these are all spiccato patches. I do believe that I do some, yeah, I've got some key switching going on here with the viola. I could tell that right here because there is a 
low note there that I'm using for key switching. And then we've got our bass here. String ensemble. And then we've got chamber violins, chamber violin two, chamber viola, chamber cello. Chamber pizzicato, cello, uh, chamber bass, and then chamber string ensemble. And then this is another ensemble. Let's see what's the difference between the two. Oh, so these are short. And then below that, we've got Albion one strings. Turn the volume on that up. Flautando strings. These, I believe, are from Tundra. Long air, ice, and uh, something or other. <laughs> really nice sound, and then pulsing consordino. Let me turn the volume on that up. So this is what I mean when I'm talking about adding some performance patches. And you sprinkle them in. You don't have them all the way through, but you sprinkle them in in a few spots and maybe you'll layer them on top of some of the other sounds. And this is not something that you can program using sampled strings. So it's really great to have these things. And this is our high swarming strings. Nice Spitfire Swarms and Swarming Winds. And these actually play well together, these two patches. And Swarm Low, I believe. Yep, Strings Low Swarm. Let's turn that up. Those are really cool to play in a spot or two. You wouldn't want them all over the track. What they do is they add some randomness when you play them all together. And we'll get into that in, in a, when we look at the beginning here. Evo strings. Yeah, let's do that again with the volume up. Yeah, that's not something you can program. And a second Evo strings patch. And then below that, I've got these routed all to these AUGS tracks. And these are all routed out. Well, and then my, I'm only using a couple of reverbs on this and to my music track with just a C6 across. This way I have one volume control when I'm sending stuff to my clients. I can ride the volume here up and down to balance it with the dialogue. All right, so I'm going to mute the dialogue here. And let's go, I'm going to shrink these tracks a little bit. And let's just take it from the top. Now, I like to start at bar one, which is actually over here. But what ended up happening was that I finished the score and... The score started 10 seconds into the film or so, and they wanted, uh, eventually, I got the note back to put something in the very opening. So I've got a few bars up front before the actual piece starts, and I didn't want to really renumber the entire piece. It was time sensitive. I had a deadlines. So let's play this right for the beginning. So that's just very spacious, 
adding sort of a mood, a, kind of a neutral emotion there. And then the next piece, I wanted something that was moving and had a little bit of positivity to it, childhood, growing up, and everything. And also, I needed it to stop on a definite beat because right here, when we get to measure five, beat three, that's when the clip from All in the Family comes in. So I needed to leave that in the clear. So let's take a listen, a measure before, and then we'll transition into the spot. So you can see that I'm just basically a fragment of an F major chord. I sort of displace the time a little bit by moving the chord changes to start an eighth note early. I like the way that that adds sort of emotion to the piece. And you can see that I helped that out by adding these low notes right over here and here and here to help accent when the chords change, right? So that helps to give a sense of displacing the beat a little bit. So then we've got this big space and then the music comes back in with more of the same. Except I add this cello pizzicato here, which is kind of really nice. Tenuto twice, I said once during the introduction. The other thing, too, that's kind of cool is that I am doubling that with, I believe, yeah, with the wind. So if I solo these guys, we can hear the combination of these two together. And the second time that this Tenuto horn comes in, I add the piano. Basically, as the piece is unfolding, every time I repeat a section, I try to do a variation and not do an exact repeat. And I do that by changing the orchestration. It really, really helps give you a sense that things are unfolding, a sense of storytelling. Right, so I add some orchestra bells on this third time through this with the piano. Okay, so right here is the Father Coughlin section, and I wanted things to start to get more dramatic, because we're talking about the beginning of World War II, and he eventually joined the Navy. I keep the feel of the rhythm going, but I go down to G minor, and let's open this up so we can take a look at the chord progression. And you hear, as we're getting into the section here, adding some to that tension are the swarms and the Evo strings. So let's just solo those. Now let's just solo the strings. And now I've got this floating section here. Let's take a listen to the dialogue here. Father Coughlin preach anti-Semitism. We believe in Christ's principle, and I challenge every Jew in this nation to tell me that he does not. If you listen to the source audio, it's incredibly noisy, and there's like a lot of echo in it, and it's very old. So if I want to have the music sound at all, I have to leave a lot of space for that. And that's why the music here gets does get very spacious, but there's no low-pitched instruments, right? It's sort of, we got the low note on the piano, but. Right, 
And then now, a nice resolution. Just in the Army Air Corps, I wanted to be known as a Jew who served, he'd later say. After the war, Norman moved his young... Now, this sounds like it's new music here, but let's take a look at the notation. Right? That's not that much different than... Right, from the opening. So, I'm doing again... The displaced chord there, right, with the rhythm right here, displacement, and notice it's just these little melodies on the top voice of the piano. So that is directly related to that opening figure in the cellos. So this is really one of the few ways that you can sort of do development of ideas in such a short three-minute piece where you've got so many different moods and textures and so many different eras of the guy's life that you go through. That brings us to this era here in the 60s with Vietnam. So you hear, there's explosions, there's all this stuff going on, protests. I have to leave room for that stuff in the music. So I don't have any timpanis, any percussion, and I leave a lot of the low, lower pitched areas free. And this way I can sort of get my music to fit in with what's gonna end up being the sound design. It's still a struggle and it's still a fight and still have to press to get your music heard, but you can sort of write music to make it a little bit easier. And what I do here is I've got this music swirling because the time was very uncertain. There was so much um, tension and so much uh, division in the country and, and violence with war and protests and assassinations of political figures and Martin Luther King and all this stuff. It just, you want the music to be a little unsettled. And that's where the swarms really come in handy because you can't really program this stuff. So it works out really well. So this is just a little a bridge. I had to fill in some space here. He's in the TV studio. And then we start talking about all of the big hit television shows he had in the 1970s. And many of them were sitcoms, but they were always sitcoms with a commentary on the social situation in America. So even though they were funny, they were still serious at the same time. And the direction I got was to have music that moved forward. And again, if we look at the piano part here, you can see how... This is basically, again, a variation on the, the cello thing that was in the opening, where... I've got now the displacement happening here in this voice, even though I've got strong downbeats. And is that cellos that are playing the counter line there? Spitfire cello. Now, notice also that I've got the strong downbeat on the left hand of the piano here. The cello's coming in in the middle of the bar. And what it's basically doing is leading us to this next note in the piano. 
So listen to it like that. In other words, it's leading us to the upcoming downbeat. Good to do, do, boom. This, this doesn't, but got to do a little variation, right? Okay. Moving forward. And again, these sort of swirling chords with uh, circular figures in the melodic aspect. He's on Nixon's enemies list here, and I wanted to bring that out. And one thing that I like here is that I've got all of these, let's see, where is that chamber cello? I believe that's this. Yeah. English horn, flute, and then there, is there brass? Yeah, there's horn to this one here. I've got all these short fragments. And that all just adds to the mood. And then in this area here, he comes across a group called the Moral Majority, and they're trying to define what patriotism is, and he's going to start something called People for the American Way. So I wanted this music to, to actually lead us in to the People for the American Way section, right? So you can hear how the motion here in the music is pushing forward, even though there's not a, a, an insistent rhythm. And again, you can hear that this is a variation on the earlier bits. It's an exact copy of the piano part, but it's f much fuller now with strings and woodwinds, some bells, trumpet, solo horn. And when we get right here, he's taking the Declaration of Independence around America so that people can actually see it. So he sets up this whole, I guess it's a tour, you'd call it. So we wanted something that sounded big and patriotic and was moving forward to the big build at the end. And what I was told by the filmmakers was this was going to be shown at the Kennedy Center Honors live. Eventually it got on the television broadcast a month later. But they wanted people to jump out of their seats at the end of it, right? And they, so you want a big ending with a big, strong button. So let's take a listen to the rest of this bit. big ending. So a couple of not notable things here is let's solo the strings so you can hear uh, this sort of like march figure that I came up with. A 
Let's see what the notation looks like on that. And you can see how I've got those accents with the velocity right here on these and phrasing up into that with the velocity here. You can see the curve going up like that. That's kind of fun. And you can hear also right here the string run. So you just add, you don't have them all over the place, but you add the live thing in really important spots and it just adds so much energy and realism to the track. Yep, uh, There's no way that I could program it to have it sound like that. So those are really handy to have. That brings us to the end of this tutorial. I'll play the score and film again with no voiceover. Before I do that, I'd just like to point out that orchestration is a vital part of film score. And if you look through the Pro Tools session, you can see that while there are many instruments, they are used for a purpose in the score. And that purpose is to help tell the story of the film. I hope you found this helpful. Leave any comments or questions below, and you'd really help out the channel with a thumbs up and a subscription. I've been Pete Calandra. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you on the next one.